at Horn who will talk on uh, algebraic space curves, old problems, and new results. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, uh, I, I realize this is a, a, a seminar of the department, but it's also a festival in honor of Fyodor Zak for his 65th birthday. <coughs> and I'm very happy. Where is he? Where is he? Oh, no, there you go. Yeah, I see. I'm very happy to be here. I, I didn't meet him so many times, uh, at least once in Paris and maybe some other time. So I, I got him to know him a little more this week, and I very much enjoy his company. So I'm very happy to be here. <coughs> so, um... My talk is going to be in five parts that are more or less independent of each other. So if you get bored in one part, you just wait for the next one. <laughs> so the, four, the five parts are going to be... Uh, <coughs> history. One. Space curves. Two. Special role of ACM curves. <coughs> and three, <coughs> families of smooth curves. And four, local cohology as D modules. Uh, this was a, the last topic was unannounced. I didn't mention that in the, in the uh, announcement. There. <clears throat> so, since this is classical geometry I'm talking about, let's start with some history. So, let's start with um, Jakob Steiner. How many people know who Jakob Steiner is? So, we'll start with this is here. And he was uh, 1796 to 1863. <clears throat> Steiner uh, was a farm boy. He grew up on a farm in Switzerland, and he helped with the cows and the sheep and, and so on. And he didn't learn to read or write until he was 14 years old. Uh, but he was very good at arithmetic and he helped his parents with the accounting for the farm. And then, um, I guess he learned to read after a while, but his parents wanted him to stay on the farm and help with the family. But somebody noticed that he was very good at mathematics and suggested that he should go to school. You know, otherwise, he would never go to school. So he went to school starting at age 18. And he turned out to be very good in mathematics, especially in geometry. He was an amazing geometer. <clears throat> so. Uh, so gradually, you know, he got a degree and he started teaching in some school, but he always got in trouble with the director of the school because the director of the school wanted to, to use his textbook and Steiner wanted to do it his own way. So he had in trouble. And even to the end of his life, apparently he was a rather, a rather crude person and spoke uh, in bad language and didn't, wasn't very polite sometimes. But he was a very good geometer. So just to illustrate, oh, when he published a paper, he would make a list of maybe 20 theorems with no proof in geometry. A short question. What? There is a Russian rumor that he failed the philosophy exam to Hegel, and for this reason he was denied some position in some German, uni German university. Oh, is that's that true? That's possible. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, I think you, know, you were supposed to be competent in two fields. Yeah. And maybe he could only do mathematics. That's quite possible. Maybe he didn't care about philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, so when he published a paper, he'd make a list of 10 or 15 statements. He'd just write them down with no proof. So I'm going to give you one example. Uh, take um, four lines in the plane. Any four lines. Well, let's see, where should we put them? We'll put them down here. <coughs> Maybe down this one. Okay, there's four lines. When you have four lines, each time you leave one out, you have a triangle. Okay. So, and we have a triangle. Let's look at one triangle. Here's one triangle. In the triangle, there's something in English we call the altitude. It's the intersection of the, the lines from the vertex perpendicular to the other side. So if you draw the altitudes here, there's one. Uh, here's another, more or less. Uh, here's another. Okay, 
they meet in one point. So you get a point. <clears throat> and it has a name. I have probably each language has a different name for it. I think it's the ortho center. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you do that with each triangle. So let's pick another one. See what happens. Let's pick uh, ooh, maybe this triangle here. So here's uh, here's one one. I'm not drawing it very accurately. And then the other right angle will be down here. And you get another point. Okay, so there's two more triangles. You again take the intersection of the altitudes in each triangle and you get four points. Well, I don't know where the others are. Let's suppose they are here. And then Steiner's theorem is that these four points lie on a straight line. <coughs> so, so if you get bored with my with my talk, you can figure out a proof of that. <laughs> I hope you like geometry. <coughs> so that was just to give an idea of Steiner. So Steiner, we, we taught for many years. He never married, <coughs> so he earned a lot of money. And at the time of his death, he was a very rich man. So he gave some to various various foundations, but he designated a big chunk of money to the Berlin the Royal Berlin Academy of Sciences for a prize. It was called the Steiner Prize. <clears throat> and in the year 1882, the topic for the Steiner Prize was the classification of space curves. So the Academy invited contributions, papers on the, on the classification of space curves, and then they would give a prize to the best one. <clears throat> and the papers were submitted anonymously. So each paper had a motto on it, maybe some Latin phrase, and then there was a sealed envelope with the Latin on the outside and the name of the author on the inside. There were three papers submitted. <clears throat> so the judges studied these papers, and they found that two of them were very good. They couldn't choose one over the other. So two were accepted for the prize, and the third was not. And the two that were accepted were by um, Max Noether <coughs> who lived from 1844 to uh, 1921, and George Halfin. who lived from 1844, same year, to 1889. <coughs> who was the guy who failed? Who was the guy who failed? Well, I kept coming to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, since the third paper was not accepted for the, um, for the prize, they destroyed the envelope with the third bottom one. <laughs> so this leaves an open problem for the historian of mathematics. Who was the third person? <laughs> I explored that a little bit. When the last time I was in Erlangen in Germany, I went into the archive of the library and I studied the, the uh, what do they call it, the reports of the Berlin Academy of Sciences and I read the, the description of this happening, but it didn't say who the third one was. So. <clears throat> if you like history, you might try. Uh, Max Noether, of course, is the father of Emmy Noether. And Noether, no theory and rings are from Emmy Noether, not from Max. But Max was a very good uh, algebraic <coughs> geometer also. So, oh, and by the way, this is not really part of my talk, but there's a, there's a, there's a theorem called Noether's theorem, perhaps you know. Uh, Noether's theorem. It says if you take a, a non-singular surface in, P, in P3 of degree at least equal to 4, and that is general, general among all the family of services of the degree of the four, and the only curves it contains are complete intersections. Only curves are complete intersections. So this is a, this is a true, st true, true theorem. It was stated by Noether. In fact, it was stated in the paper he, he submitted on space curves, so in the paper he submitted here. This, this theorem is stated, but it's not stated as a theorem. It comes in the middle of a paragraph and not even asserted as, a, as a, an assertion. It's just in the middle of the some sentence blah, 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 because a general surface contains only complete intersection curves and it goes on. 
So that's that's the only reference there in that paper. So it wasn't, he didn't say the theorem, he, he just sort of passed by as it was something that was well known. <coughs> and uh, later, um, uh, let's see, I guess maybe it was Lefschetz. Lefschetz provided a proof around 1920 or something. And he says, he says, a, a theorem considered by Noether. And some other people refer to this. If you look at the at the Encyclopedia of Automation Wissenschaften, the great big, the great big long book of, of uh, explanations, they say that it was a, a, a theorem stated by Noether, but that his proof by by accounting constants was considered insufficient. Well, there was no proof at all. So, <coughs> and that has been proved. And it's been proven arbitrary characteristic over any fields like the mean and the Gordon Lee So it's a good theorem. But it's strange that it's called Noether's theorem because he, he didn't even say that it was a theorem and he didn't give a proof. So that's just a, by, a little byproduct. Excuse me, yeah. is it the advertisement of your book on deformation? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, thank you, yes. It's an advertisement of my book because I have a proof. I have a proof in my book on deformation theory. Uh, I invented the proof myself, but I'm, I'm sure that the ingredients are known from, there, from other places. And then in the little notes, you probably noticed the little, the, the little notes at the end of the chapter, historical notes. I explained the, the background of this and who said what. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's new. <coughs> All right. So I think, so basically I want to start by discussing uh, the, the questions that were considered in these two papers by Max Nutter and George Hoffman. They're both from 1882. So the papers are from 1882. So this is going to be section one. Space course. <coughs> Let's see. That section took about 10 minutes. Uh, that's great. I'll be finished in an hour. But I, I, I think the others will take a little longer. So <coughs> let's look at the questions. What were the questions concerned? Well, so if, you, if you, look, you take a curve in P3, so this will be a non-singular curve. And irreducible in P3. And of course, they never said so, but they were always <laughs> thinking of the complex numbers. At that time, varieties over fields of finite characteristic were not thought of. So that's what they're talking about. Then there's a degree, there's a degree, which is the number of points that, that a general hyperplane cuts in the field curve here. Yes. The degree is the number of points it cuts. It's a genus. <laughs> which is, uh, if you don't know what the genus is, it's, it's hard to, it's a little, a little complicated to define, so I won't define the genus. <clears> There's <throat> a genus. We know the degree is always at least equal to 1, and the genus is at least equal to 0. And so the first question would be, what are the possible values? This is a fairly complicated question, actually. <clears throat> so there are various different ways of looking at this. Um, if you start out simply, you look on, on particular surfaces. So on the, in the projected plane, you can find curves with any degree greater than equal to 1, and the genus is completely determined by the degree. The genus is equal to 1 half d minus 1, d minus 2. And if you look at a quadric surface, uh, a quadric surface, you know, it has, a, it has these two rulings. So a curve on the quadric surface has a bi-degree. So a bi-degree AB. And in terms of those, the degree is a plus b, and the genus is a minus 1 times b minus 1. So you can figure out all possible values of d and g on a quadric surface. But if I draw a picture, I put d this way and g this way. So the plane curves, curves in the plane, this is approximately 1 half d squared. And you get these different, different values of dg. And on the quadric surface, you have a line here that's approximately uh, oh, I didn't say that. But if you, if you figure this out, you find that g is less than or equal to one-fourth of uh, d squared minus d plus 1. So there's a, something of the line is approximately one-fourth d squared. And then this points on this line and underneath these various values of d and g that exist, exist like that. 
And then <coughs> if you look on a cubic surface, I'll see uh, x cubic surface. On the cubic surface, you can find the genus <coughs> is always bounded by 1 sixth v v minus 3 plus 1. So there's another line here that's about 1 sixth v squared. And then the question is, what happens under here? <coughs> well, uh, Halfen in his book stated correctly that every possible value of d and g underneath this curve is possible. So any there, any uh, g, any g satisfying this exists. <coughs> However, Halfen was not quite correct because he claimed that these all existed on cubic surfaces, and that's incorrect. And uh, this situation was was uh, corrected in 1982 by Bourgeois and Pesquin. Boom, Pesquin is here. That went here. And they provided a correct proof of this theorem here that every possible D and G exists. And it's quite interesting. What they did, they found another, they found another curve that's sort of in here. It's approximately D to the three halves power or something. And then in the range, in the upper range here, they exist on cubic surfaces. And in the lower range, down here, they exist on quartic surfaces. So this it gives a complete answer to the original question of the possible D and G. Now there's a more refined question. More refined question. Which has to do with the possible degree of a surface that contains a given curve. So the more refined question, which uh, is come to be called Halfin's problem. says the following, if you fix, a, fix K and you ask what is the maximum genus, and I'll call it G, D, K, of a non-singular curve of degree D that is not contained in any surface of degree less than k. <coughs> so this is to make a more precise answer about what possible surfaces are certain curves can lie on. Smooth or any? Smooth? Mm, any surface. Any. Doesn't have to be smooth. <coughs> so uh, this number here, if you, if you see what it says, this is, these are contained in a plane. So they're certainly not contained in any surface of degree less than g. So this is g of d1, this is this one. And this number here is g of d2. These, these are contained in a, in a quadric surface, but they're not contained in a plane. So this means, this means this is the maximum genus of a curve that's not contained in a plane. And this number here will be d3. And after that, it's not so easy to figure out this number. So again, if I draw a picture, uh, I'm going Sorry, to draw a picture. Sorry, before you resume, can I didn't get it. What happens between the quadric line and the cubic line? I mean, between the quadric line and the cubic line, there are isolated points, but not all of them. They have to be they have to be given by pairs of integers a and b with these two properties, and that does not does not fill up the space. So the complete answer is everything, actually everything under this curve here, and then isolated points are here, and then points on this line here. <coughs> Excuse me? What about quadratic cone? Does it produce some point? Uh, quadratic cone, of course, it produces curves, but every possible degree in genus on a quadratic cone already exists on a non-singular quadratic surface. Uh, in fact, if you put, if you put, uh, a, if you put b equal to either a or a plus 1, you'll get the g degree in g as occurs on a quadratic cone. <coughs> okay. So let's draw a picture of uh, g, g, k. Uh, 
And if you really divide, the problem depends on k. Depending on k, you get different answers. So this, we usually divide, divide into three different areas. Uh, range A. So the range A, which is, um, I'll just give you the proximal formula, one-sixth uh, d squared plus the range of k plus the range of one-third d squared. <coughs> oh, sorry, k. Uh, the other way around. K squared plus the range of d. Yeah. Yeah, D should, when D is, is small like this, then the V, which is approximately one third K squared up to uh, K times K minus one. And then the C, which is uh, K times K minus one, uh, and it's even bigger. <clears throat> so first of all, if, if the degree is less than a sixth K squared, this is not the exact formula. I'm leaving out the lower term. If degree is less than, then there are no curves. In other words, any curve has to have k has to be d as some some sort of like that. And then the range C is a beautiful theorem. Range C is a beautiful theorem again by Guzan and Pliskian, which gives you a formula g of d k. It's approximately one over two k of d squared plus lower terms. So you recognize in this formula the continuation of the, of the, of the sequence we saw. For, for in the case of one, it was a half d squared. This is a, the quadruple with a fourth of d squared, a sixth of d squared. Well, the corresponding generalization of that is valid in this third range. <clears throat> Another beautiful paper. So I'm, I'm, I'm indebted again to Peskin uh, for all of these results. <clears throat> That's a, a beautiful theorem. And it, it, moreover, they find the maximal curves are all ACM curves. So uh, maximal GS uh, ACM. So let me define ACM right away. Uh, that's the problem. So the curve C in P3 is arithmetically which is usually abbreviated ACM. If what you do is you take the, the polynomial ring in four variables, the homogeneous coordinate ring, x0, x1, x2, x3, you divide by the homogeneous ideal of C, and you ask it, is a quantum quality ring? Well, uh, if you don't know what a quantum Macaulay ring that is, that, that doesn't help. This is, I'm passing the buck over to algebra. The quantum Macaulay ring is an algebraic concept. concept. <clears throat> and by the way, this same, this same concept here, uh, for a non-singular call curve, it used to be called projectively normal. So if you've heard the word projectively normal, it's the same thing. <clears throat> it's also equivalent to the following statement. It's equivalent to saying that if you look at the global sections of OPN, of n, op3 of n, which maps to the global section of oc of n, uh, this is surjective for all n. <clears throat> so that's, a, that's a, an equivalent characterization. And by the way, this we've been talking about non-singular curves, but this definition makes sense for an arbitrary uh, closed subscheme. <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be singular. But for a non-singular curve, it's equivalent to being projectively normal. So these are the specially nice curves. It's the best possible, best possible world. <clears throat> Another way of thinking about them is that if you look at the exact sequence cohomology, the next term over here would be H1 of the ideal sheet of sequence of L1, and then comes a zero after that. So you can use this co-kernel over here to measure whether a curve is ACM or how far away it is. And you can particularly define a certain module, M, which is the direct sum over all <coughs> n and z of h1 i c of n. And this is called the Rao module after uh, Rao, Prabhakar Rao. <coughs> because, so if m is 0, that's the same thing as being ACM. 
So the others have a certain rel module. And this is uh, because rel proved a theorem saying that the uh, liaison equivalence class, which I may define later, of, of a curve is, is exactly determined by this module. <coughs> so this module determines the liaison equivalence classes. I may come back to that. <coughs> okay, so anyway, the result of Grizzle Pesky is, is very beautiful because it gives, it gives a good bound, and it shows that all the curves are, are ACM curves, which are very nice curves, and that's a very good answer. <coughs> now, in the range A, it's easy to prove a bound. Easy to show that the genus is always less than or equal to a certain number, which I don't write down. I will. Anyway, maybe I can. G, D, K. Did I write that down here? In which range? Uh, in A. The A, A range. It's easy to prove a bound. Uh, you just use some... Uh, what do you use? You just use elementary facts on curves. Clifford's theorem. Um, how are, proving the existence of curves, that this is the maximum, is a little bit more complicated. But I believe that's been done over the whole range by uh, Balico and uh, uh, Ilya and Mura Roch and Charles Walder, uh, maybe somebody else. Uh, I'm not sure they're all published, because the proofs are very unpleasant. Yeah, all kinds of complicated computations. But basically, they show that in, a ra in the A range, for every, there's, a, there's a certain bound that's easy to establish, and then they show the existence. So this leaves the B range. In the B range, <coughs> in the B range, <coughs> By the way, the B range is empty until you get to K equals 4 or 5 or something. But in the B range, this is a subject that I worked on with Hirschovitz. So, Andre Hirschovitz. Uh, back in the 1980s. <clears throat> and we have, we have a whole series of papers on this topic. Um, uh, something very amusing, you know, collaboration is a very interesting process between mathematicians. Uh, maybe some of you have heard about the collaboration between uh, Hardy and Littlewood. <clears throat> and apparently they had, uh, they had, a, they wrote down the rules of the collaboration. And one of the rules, so one of the rules was that um, any one of them, either one of them could write a letter to the other anytime he liked. And the next one rule was that the second one did not have to read it if he didn't want to. <laughs> and the next rule was that any paper that either of them published during the term of their collaboration had both names on it. No, interest, interesting rules. That doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my collaboration with, with Irshavitz was the opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I thought we were collaborating, we were doing joint work. But every single paper, half the time we spent writing the paper, and half the time we spent discussing, now is this a joint paper, or is it his paper, or is it my paper? <laughs> so if you look at the series of papers, there's, uh, I don't know, six or eight of them. Some of them have both names. Some of them have my name, and I say this is part of an ongoing collaboration with Andre Yershevitz. And some of them has his name, and says without the collaboration of Robin Harson, I couldn't have, couldn't have written this paper. So uh, it's curious. Anyway, in these papers, uh, we attempted to solve the range B. And what we thought we, we ended up doing was we proved an existence theorem of curves with a certain uh, D and G for each K. And we strongly believe that these are the maximal possible genus of curves in those ranges, but we can't prove that that is the maximum. So we constructed the curves. So we're unable to, we believe they're the maximum. So they're supposed, hopefully maximal. <coughs> but we could not succeed in proving it. We wrote them down an explicit conjecture, which is through statement is so complicated, I'm not going to rate it. But I'll give you the approximate formula is GDK uh, less than or equal to approximately one fourth of D times K minus seven plus square root of 12D minus 3K squared minus 6K plus 1 plus 1. Uh, now, if you look at this, it's got, a D, it's got a D inside the radical and a D out here. So it's about uh, one third of D to the three halves power. There's a 12 comes out here, that brings out a 
to me to cancel. Hmm? No, no, no. What did I say? Uh, let's try again. Root 3 over 2, maybe. Let's try that. We have a 4, 2. Yeah, root 3. It's partially root 3 over 2 times e to the 3 halves. <clears throat> so this is a, this is a, um, so if you draw a picture of the, of the actual band, GDK, it looks like this. In the A range, it's a straight line. And in the C range, it's quadratic. <coughs> and in here, it's made up of a bunch of little pieces that, that fit together to give something about like this. And the actual little piece, so our formula gives the exact, the exact bound of what we expect it to be. So I promised you some open problems. Uh, in this lecture. So this is one of the open problems. Through these are now. <coughs> now let me just say a couple more things about how we went about proving this. In order to construct curves, we used uh, something called the, the share, share correspondence. Uh, if you have a curve in B3, A curve in B3, and if you take a section of uh, C in H0 of omega C of minus L, some number, uh, this, this is isomorphic to a certain X group, and this allows you to make an extension of, uh, and I don't have the right numbers here, so a certain O of something, or I'll call it A, goes to E, goes to the ideal sheet of number B. I don't, the, the exact numbers are depend on, on the, the L and the degree of the genus. Um, so you can get a non-trivial extension here. And what is E? See, this is a this is a light an invertible sheaf on the projected space. This is rank one. So E will be a rank two. Well, if you're lucky, it's a vector bundle, but more generally, it fails to be a vector bundle at a finite number of points. So it's a uh, <coughs> reflexive sheaf. So in this way, every time you have a curve, when you choose a twist of the, of the, of the differentials and you choose a section in there, it's going to give you an extension like this. Conversely, if you give a, if you have a sheaf E and you take a section, you can run it backwards and you get a curve. So there's a correspondence between curves in P3 together with the choice of a section C and reflexive sheaves break two on P3 together with the choice of a global section or some twist. Maybe there's a twist in here. So we use this method to uh, study an analogous problem about reflexive sheaves on P3. So you can translate the problem into the question about if you have an E <coughs> Also, it happens that the range we're interested in corresponds to stable sheet. Now, stable ones are much better than the others. So we actually we, are, we, will, we will get stable in our case. So you, then you have a problem if E is a stable reflexive sheet. It has numerical invariants. They're called churn classes. C1, C2, and C3. And the problem of bounding the genus of the curve boils down to a problem of giving a lower bound. So if you fix C1, you ask for a lower bound on C2 and an upper bound on C3. <coughs> so the problem is translated into a problem on kind of stable reflection sheets. Now this problem here, we were able to solve completely. So we answered the question about the stable reflexive sheaves. <coughs> and again, I have to thank Peskin, because uh, I had a very, we had a very, very complicated proof uh, for rank two things. And then he proved the paper uh, going to rank three vector bundles instead of a rank two reflexive, going to rank three vector bundles on the projective space, which greatly simplified the proofs. So using uh, Peskin's method, we got a much, much, much better proof. So we were able to solve this, this, um, this problem completely. And this problem completely, and we also know what the maximum sheaves look like. So you can take the maximum sheaves and then take a section and get curves. Uh, now in order to get those maximum sheaves, another interesting point is we had to get a sheaf with lots of nice properties. It had to have, have to be singular only to a finite number of points. And at each of those points, the singularity had to be the kind that would allow you to get a non-singular curve when you took a section. And then the cohomology had to be a certain way. 
And each of these properties is something we could establish separately. We could prove the existence of a torsion-free sheaf with good cohomology, for example. Or we could prove the, the existence of a, of a coherent sheaf with the good local properties of the singularity. And these properties were all uh, what they call open properties, the properties in the Zariski topology. So if you have a, a, a moduli space, and you know that this property, you have it over here, but it's an open property. It's true most of the time. And if you prove this property over here, it's an open property. It's true most of the time. So that way, there existed points in which all the good properties. Now, I'm just mentioning that because it's very much of an existence proof without any construction. And it doesn't allow you to actually construct them. So uh, if you want to work on this problem, first of all, the problem is to prove the bound. But I think, first of all, it would be nice to find another construction of these maximal curves without using the reflexive <coughs> sheaves. And that should be possible using liaison theory. You find the, find, find the curves of low degree, and then you use a liaison to make them of high degree. So that should be possible. And then I think these, are, these maximal curves are going to be very interesting curves to study. It's sort of the next, after the ACM curves, they won't be ACM curves, that's the ACM curves. They should be a very special curve to learn. I think that'd be an interesting class of curves to study. So there is one open problem for uh, someone with, with some courage to dive into the, the, the papers are technical. But maybe the best thing to do is ignore the old papers and start again uh, and find a new way of doing it. Okay. So. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted to talk about, I'll go on to section two now, ACM curves. earlier part of the talk, you can see that the possible degree and genus of curves in P3 is a very complicated subject, and there's so many different kinds of curves. But the ACM curves are particularly nice. So the nice thing about the ACM curves is the ACM curves are completely determined by a finite set of numerical invariants. Now, ACM curves are determined by, by some number of invariants. And the unfortunate thing is in the literature, each author has a different system of setting up these invariants. In the paper of Grusel Pesquin, they talk about the numerical character of an ACM curve. <clears throat> in the work of uh, Martin Deschamps and Perrin, they talk about the postulation character of a curve. Uh, in the work of Margioni and Ragusa, they have the H vector of the curve. Uh, <clears throat> in a paper that I wrote with my former student, uh, Enrico Schlesinger, we have the, the uh, postulation uh, the uh, liaison, what do, we, what do we call it? Uh, liaison, liaison character. Anyway, I'll give you the H vector, which is the easiest to understand. So, uh, H vector looks like this. It's a sequence of integers. Uh, C0 equals 1, C1, C2, uh, CR. And they always start out 1, 2, 3, up to some number S. And then after S, they may be constant for a while, and then after that, they decrease back down to zero. So in other words, so you can have one, two, three up to some s, then you may have s, 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 but once you drop from below s, then it has to descend uh, strictly down to the bottom. So I'll give you a typical example. One, two, three, four, four, three, one. That's an acceptable uh, h vector. Now in terms of the h vector, the degree is simply the sum of all the CL. Right? And the genus <coughs> is the sum for i bigger than or equal to 2 of i minus 1 times CI. So let me give you an example. Um, <coughs> example. <coughs> one, two. <coughs> uh, my colleague uh, David Eisenbahn at Berkeley has this weekly seminar. There's always some kind of algebraic geometry every week. And one of his requirements is that every talk should mention the twisted cubic curve sometime. <laughs> so we look at this, look at this h vector, the degree is equal to 3, and the genus you get by taking 0, 0, and then 1, 2, 3 times these guys. So the genus is 0. This is a twisted cubic curve. For another example, 
one, two, three would be in degree six, and G is three. Those are they lie on cubic surfaces. It's a nice AC here. Uh, another thing, another thing you can read off of this is that S is the least degree of a surface containing the curve. The least degree of a surface uh, containing the curve. C. So you can write down all possible degree in genus of ACM curves. Um, for the same D and G, you may have different H vectors giving the same degree in genus. So that happens sometimes. <clears throat> so the nice thing about ACM curves is you can, that you can work with them much, much, much better than arbitrary curves. And uh, <clears throat> one of my uh, philosophies is that uh, any, any general problem about space curves, you should solve for uh, the case of ACM curves first. And that should be easier. So I can, let me give you one example. Uh, Example. Suppose you take a curve C in B3, a degree D in genus G, and you want to know what is the maximum order of a multi secant. A multi secant is when you take a line that meets the curve many times. How many times can a line meet the curve? Uh, twisted cubic curve, for example, uh, the answer is uh, 2 because the first cubic curve lies on a quadratic surface, and the line, one of the step family of lines meets it twice, and the other meets it once. So maximum order of a multi is uh, I think, let's see, is it obvious for a complete intersection? You have a complete intersection, and the line meets it many times. As soon as the line meets it enough times, it's, well, Anyway, for multi for complete intersection, it's easy. Oh, I can tell you, for a complete intersection, if you have a complete intersection of S cross T with S less than or equal T, its H vector looks like 1, 2, 3, up to S, and then copy of, number of copies of S, T minus S, copies, and then S minus 1, and back down to 1. So that's the, <coughs> that's the H vector of a complete intersection. <clears throat> so anyway, this is not, not so different, and it was a paper by my former student, uh, Scott Mallet, uh, who completely answers this question. <coughs> Where for arbitrary curves, to be in genesis, it's not the wrong For ACM curves or for? ACM, ACM curves, yeah. He answers the question for ACM curves. Yeah, I'm, I'm just talking about ACM curves, because I want to illustrate <coughs> that, that various questions you can ask are not so difficult for ACM curves. Now, another related question is um, the notion of, uh, if C is ACM, the notion of gonality. You see, if you have a curve C of genus G, uh, you'd like to know what possible linear systems does it have. So a linear system is usually written G, R, D. Okay. This G is doesn't mean genus. This G is, for some historical reason, it's used to denote linear systems. I don't even know why. Anybody know why it's G? Anyway, GRD means linear system of dimension R and degree D. Ah, it's D ought to be, let's call it, let's call it uh, N, degree N. The degree N linear system is a collection of, collection of N points. On the, on the curve, and then they move in a linear system. This is G from the root gonality? What? Uh, this is G from the root gonality? No, because this is English. The G existed long before English. No, no, the G comes from Enrique. From Enrique? Groups of points of dimension R and Oh, groups. Oh, good. Okay. In Italian, group. Group. Yeah, okay. Not gonality. So, the question of the gonality is um, what is is the largest, or rather, <coughs> uh, the largest? No, you want the smallest. Right? What is the smallest n for which there exists a g1n? That's called the gonality. Because a g1n gives you a, 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 gives you a, a map <coughs> of the curve c down to p1. So it measures it measures um, what kind of a covering the curve is over C1. So if you have a G11, for example, a G11 would be an isomorphism between the curve. So if, if there exists a G11, the curve is already rational. So 
So the question then is on a given curve of genus G, what what is the Gonell? And in the in the moduli of, of curves, if you look at the moduli space of curves of genus G, there exist curves whose normality <coughs> not one, but anywhere from two up to whatever the maximum is, which I forget. A certain number that I've forgotten. It's a well-known number, but I forgot what it is. <clears throat> so you can ask, what about the gonality? And again, I'm indebted to Peskin because his former student, uh, Basili, showed that on a complete intersection curve, if C is a complete intersection curve, they showed, uh, I guess, a general. You have to assume it's pretty sufficiently general. See, the gonality, in a, continue, in, a, in a smooth family, the gonality changes. It goes back and forth. In the long so you ask for, if you take a general one, what's the gonality in that case? And they showed in that case, the gonality is determined by the maximum multi secant. Now, why is that? You see, if you have the curve like this, and you have a multi secant, L in P3, you can use L as a center of projection, and you can project the curve down to a P1. And what's the degree of the projection? Well, the curve has degree D, right? But L, you, when you when points where L meets the curve get blown up, or not defined here, so the degree of this projection is going to be the degree of C minus Let's call it U of L, the number of well, just L dot C. L dot C, the intersection. So the bigger you make the multi secant, the smaller you get this thing, and you find the gonality. So they proved that for a complete intersection, the gonality is given exactly by the maximum multi secant. So in a paper of, of mine with uh, uh, Enrico Schlesinger, we proved the same thing for a general ACM curve. In other words, general, and now general means you fix the H vector and you consider a general curve in there because for the fixed H vector, the Hilbert scheme is irreducible. It makes sense to talk about a general curve. So a general ACM curve, the answer is the same. The gonality is given by the degree of the curve minus the maximum degree of uh, a multi secant. And from Nolet's paper, we know what the maximum degree of a multi secant is, so we get an actual formula. Uh, there's a couple of special cases. Uh, sometimes the curve is forced to lie on a surface of lower degree that has some lines in it, and there's a few exceptional cases there. But sometimes there's a line of much higher uh, expect, not what you expect. Anyway, we have a complete answer. So that, again, uh, it, it, it shows my principle that the problem ought to be easier for ACM curves. For, for arbitrary curves, uh, certainly this, it's just fixed degree in genus and some component of the Hilbert scheme. I don't think there's any, there's any idea about uh, this result here. So those are a couple of couple of cases where the uh, we got a positive answer. Now another case. Uh, ah yes. <clears throat> Let's look at the normal bundle to a space curve. So if C is any non singular curve in P3, you can look at the normal bundle of C in P3, use the rank 2 vector bundle. And it would be nice to know uh, what kind of properties this, um, this vector bundle has. In particular, there's a notion of semi-stable and stable. And I forget who it was first. Was it Brower or was it Fundeman? It first gave an example of a curve whose normal bundle was semi-stable. See, this is not so obvious. Uh, it's the opposite of splitting. If you take a complete intersection curve, if C is equal to, uh, say, F A and say F B, surface of degree A and B, then the normal bundle is simply O of A, where it's um, O of B, which splits. And that's, that's the opposite of stable. Stable is very good. Stable means there's no subline bundle of too high a degree. So the question you'd like to know is, is N stable or semi-stable. <clears throat> now there's an obvious obstruction. 
And that is, if C happens to lie on a surface X of degree S, then there's an exact sequence of normal bundles. The normal bundle of C and X goes to the normal bundle of C and P3, goes to the normal bundle of X and P3, restricted to C. So the fact of lying on a surface of degree S gives you right away a certain subbundle. Now, depending on the numbers involved, this subbundle may, may contradict the possibility of being stable. So to rule that out, uh, I'll this down somewhere. I'll let you figure it out. But the point is, this gives you an inequality. This, this, this will contradict stability in a certain case. So this gives you a necessary condition. for uh, NC to be stable or semi-stable. Right. Let, me, let me just find, this is a very simple thing. Let me just find it for you. It's nice to have precise statements. Over here. Okay. Necessary condition is that G, uh, G should be less than or equal to D times S minus 2 plus 1 for semi state. <clears throat> so the open problem then is if you assume this condition, you could state this, you could state this problem for any curve. So for any curve. You can say, assume that uh, G is less than or equal to D times S minus 2 plus 1. Does this imply that the normal bundle of C and D3 is the same state? Now, first of all, there's no hope unless you assume some generality curve C. So let's make C general in some sense. But even if you take an arbitrary curve in the Hilbert scheme without assuming ACM, I, I think it's hopeless. But the good question is, assume that C is ACM and general, and then is this true? Uh, this is an open problem. Um, I've worked, I've discussed it with uh, Emiko Steisinger with the field of and we thought about it for a while, we made some computations. And it may be true up to a certain degree, 10 or 12 or something. Uh, but we couldn't make it work in general. So I think that's another nice problem. And it's sort of a test of this idea whether whether you should be able to solve every problem about ACM curves. All right. Let me mention another problem about ACM curves. Here's one of this. OK, one more. <clears throat> the next problem is Supposing you fix D and G, and you consider curves of degree D and G is G, and you ask, what is, I'll say it in words first, what's the largest number of points in P3 that you can form require such a curve to pass through? So what is the largest M such that for any set of M points in P3, there exists a curve C in this collection here, <coughs> such that C contains all the points. You want to get. <coughs> I mean, just to give you an example, you mentioned the twisted cubic curve. I think the number is six in that case. Twisted cubic curve. You can make, you can choose six arbitrary points in P3, and you can make the twisted cubic curve pass through. <coughs> Uh, this was the subject of Daniel Perlin's thesis. <coughs> uh, 
and he got some upper bounds and some lower bounds, uh, and he got a complete answer up to degree, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something. <clears throat> but the general, the total problem is still unsolved. So I'm proposing, I would propose to answer this question for ACM curves. And there, again, I believe it should not be too difficult, but I don't know the answer. So there's another helping problem. <clears throat> Uh, this one may be easier than the one about the stable intervals, except they're related, you know. Uh, anytime, well, I, well, let me just point out one thing. There's, there's one, obvious, uh, one obvious obstruction, and that is that when you choose m points in P3, that's a total of three m parameters, right? So there's, there's a three m dimension. So you better make sure that the dimension of the Hilbert scheme, Hill of DG, has dimension at least equal to three m. Otherwise, there's no hope. <coughs> but for the ACM curves, we know the dimension. We know that for each, each, uh, <coughs> for each um, one of these uh, h vectors, the corresponding Hilbert scheme is irreducible. The general member of it is uh, is, is uh, non-singular. We know the dimension of that thing. So this is this is something you can fix very easily for ACM curves. So I think this is another nice problem. Another nice problem that, that should be should be manageable. <coughs> okay. Now we'll have a break in a few minutes. But I want to mention one more question associated with ACM curves. And this has to, has to do with the property of liaison. That's French, or linkage, uh, in English. Uh, and again, we have to thank Beskine uh, together with Spiro who wrote the fundamental paper about the, the liaison equivalence of curves in P3. And the main reason they used liaison is they referred to the book, the famous book by Chaudreau de la Clos called Le Liaison Dangereuse. <laughs> it's referred to in the, in, the, in the references in the end of their paper. So that's where the word liaison comes in. <clears throat> and by the way, if you come to Berkeley, I can take you out to lunch at the Bistro Liaison in Berkeley we have there. We have a mathematical friend, we have to go there and celebrate liaison. So they, are, they were talking about liaison of curves in P3. But I'm going to tell, tell you about Gorenstein liaison of points in P3. So if you have a set of points, let's say sigma 1, sigma equals some collection P1 up to PR, just a set of points. And supposing we take sigma and we put it inside an ACM curve. C. Supposing, supposing these points have to rely on some ACM curve. And then on C, we consider the linear system C plus H, where H is a hyperplane class. <coughs> so you add a hyperplane class to it, and then the points move around, and you take some divisor in here, let's call it sigma prime, is in this linear system. So if, if this was R points, that was R points, then sigma prime will have R plus D points, because the hyperplane class is D points. And then we say that sigma and sigma prime are related by a Gorenstein by liaison. <coughs> this is a uh, elementary Gorenstein by liaison. If <coughs> you perform this operation over and over again with different ACM curves and different sets of points, you get an equivalence relation. So, Two sets of points are equivalent if there's a finite sequence of ACM curves, so that each one is related to the next one by adding or subtracting the hyperplane. Okay. <coughs> That's an equivalence relation of a set of points. So it's an equivalence relation of sets of subsets. <coughs> this is called Gorenstein by liaison. There's something else that's called Gorenstein liaison, which I'm not going to define. But if you already know what it is, I just want to point out that this is not necessarily equivalent to an even number of Gorenstein liaisons. <coughs> Certainly, any one of these is an even Gorenstein liaison, but it's not known whether an even Gorenstein liaison is given by a Gorenstein by liaison. That's all. <coughs> so the big problem here is question, which is very much, very much open, <coughs> is Every finite subset sigma in P3, Gorenstein finally is on equivalent to one point. <coughs> this is known to be true for uh, oh, it's known to be true for up to 19 points. 
Now, the case of 20 points is interesting. 20 points, I have a joint paper together with, with David Eisenbaugh and Frank Olaf Schreier. And it's called 20 points in P3, supposedly. And in that paper, uh, we prove that a set of general set of 20 points in P3 is Gordon-Sein liaison equivalent to a point. But we don't know whether it's Gordon-Sein liaison. So uh, this is a hard problem, I think. <clears throat> the trouble is, uh, if you want to make an equivalence, uh, if you try to just go down and get lesser each time, then you can see what happens. But <clears throat> that may not work. So an arbitrary equivalence, you may have to start by going up first and then coming down and eventually getting down to a point. And that's very hard to control. <clears throat> so before the break, I just want to mention one more paper, a recent paper of mine. <clears throat> <coughs> Together with the uh, Bill Samuel Roach in Barcelona, <coughs> we made a study. If you have two ACM curves, C and B, two ACM curves, <coughs> so each one is an H vector, <coughs> and we assume that they're each, they're each uh, corresponding to different H vectors. So depending on their H vectors, we say what is the maximum intersection number of C and D. <clears throat> this is a generalization of the problem of multi-secant lines. There's a line, of course, is ACM. So a multi-secant line is the maximum intersection of a line with a curve. So here we ask for the maximum intersection <clears throat> of two ACM curves. And we have a, a fairly satisfactory answer to that. It's a formula that works most of the time. This generalizes earlier work with Rana style. Uh, my, my intention of doing this was, was to attach, attach it to this problem. Because you're going to go on side by lane, so you go up for a while. At a certain point at the top, you have to go back down again. So there has to be a little, a little summit there. And at the summit, you've got two ACM curves that are meeting in a lot of points. So I figured if we can bound the number of points, that might help put some money on it. No one is, as far as I know, no one is trying to do that. Okay, so at this point, let's take a 10 minute break. The cubic shifters. Yeah. And of course there exist complete intersections. And we studied the Hilbert scheme of curves of this degree. So a Hilbert scheme of 2051 has uh, four irreducible components. Uh, y1 is the complete intersections. And this is a this is a this is a car uh, uh, this is a Hilbert scheme of dimension, this is a complement of dimension 85. And then there's Y2, which is uh, pairs of the four 15, comma, 5, 4, and 5 on a cubic surface. And this is degree dimension 89. And Y3, I'll explain this in a minute, 16, uh, 6, 5, 3, 4, 3. This has dimension. And then y4 is a subcanonical 4 or 5 curve on a rural cubic surface. This is a singular surface. Here it's a, it's a, it's a double line. And this compound has dimension 96 and it's non reduced. So this is a particularly bad Hilbert scheme. And our example lies in here. So in these four components of the Hilbert scheme, the question is, does there exist a family of curves CT in here which specializes to C0 in there? And that question we were unable to decide. And of course that's so um, does this mean I expect a positive answer or negative answer? I don't really know. Not. <coughs> but it does point out how little we know about families of curves, what, what, uh, what kind, one kind of thing can, can specialize to another. So that's, that's the, 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 the story, <coughs> so the problem is still open. Do but you know I, anything about the non-reduced components? The what about it? Do you know anything about the embedded components? Uh, no. I, when we say non-reduced, I think it's generic from non-reduced. I mean, non-reduced is a generic form, but I don't know whether it's embedded components or not. Yeah. There's been quite a lot of study recently, examples of Hilbert schemes with with non-reduced structures, starting with Mumford's example of degree 14, genus 24, uh, which is generically non-reduced. Since then, other people have found lots more. Sleta in Norway found lots and lots and lots of examples of non-reduced schemes, and there's no place we have some more. 
And then there's also Hilbert schemes which are generically reduced but have embedded components along with subvariety and all kinds of stuff. It's not ICM, right? What? Last one. It's not, it's not ICM. Not ACM? Uh, last one. The curve? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't remember. Maybe if it's ACM. Yeah, anyway, let me, I'm not sure about that. But let me point out what the trouble is. See, the trouble is that our original curve, in the case of the 4-5, the original curve is a complete intersection of a quartic surface with a quintic surface. Now, you can imagine the quartic surface is therefore unique. There's only, there's only one quartic surface. So you could take that family of quartic surface and let it degenerate and see what happens. So let's say that F4 uh, is the quartic, F4P is the quartic surface containing CT. You can degenerate it to F4 zero, which will contain C0, of course. Now, if the, the limit surface is irreducible, then you win. It's, very, it's easy to show that if, if C0 is contained, if the limit of that is irreducible, if, that's the, if the smallest degree surface containing C0 is degree 4, then it's easy to show that it is a complete intersection. So you see what happens in this case is that the, these guys are contained in surfaces degree 4, and the other three cases are all contained in cubic surfaces. I forgot to explain this notation. On a non singular cubic surface, the divisor class group is 6 Z6, so it tells you degree A and then the six other numbers. So the point is, Really, the question is whether the family can happen so that the, the limit surface has a lower degree, especially could the limit surface, of course, it, it's still degree 4, but it might be a cubic surface plus a plane, for example. So that's what we want to avoid. And so we've cooked up a conjecture that will take care of that. So here's a conjecture. Uh, if the uh, original problem was conjecture A, this is going to be conjecture B. So conjecture B says, if C contained in P3, T is a flat family of curves, uh, degree B, and suppose that for all T uh, different from zero, CT is contained in a normal surface, Xt of minimal degree. S and C of T of uh, I, I use the notion a little, little S to denote the least degree of a surface containing a curve. So S of C of T is the least degree of a surface. Supposing X the least degree surface is normal for all T not equal to zero. Then, oh, uh, oh, and suppose that S of C zero is less than S of C T. In other words, supposing when you pass to C0, the smallest degree surface is actually smaller than it was for CT. So that's the bad case. Then our conclusion is, the characteristic the conclusion is, then D is less than a squid. Uh, except uh, S equals 3, we allow D equals 9 is allowed. So in other words, this conjecture says that any time <coughs> the minimal surface drops in dimension, then the degree must have been small. In fact, valued by S squared. <clears throat> now, what would that say in, in the case of the, 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 the previous conjecture? The previous conjecture, the <coughs> surfaces would be 4 and 5. The degree is 20, which is bigger than... So S, S is 4. <coughs> the, general, the general curve was, was contained in the surface degree 4, so S is 4. And the degree is 20, which is bigger than 4 squared. <coughs> so this would contradict the conjecture. It would say that that can't happen. So conjecture A is a consequence of conjecture B. Now, do I have any evidence for conjecture B? Uh, it's true for S equals 2. Uh, very weak evidence. What does it say for S equals 2? It says, if you have a family of curves that are contained in a quadric surface, <coughs> could the limit curve be contained in a plane? And the answer is no, <coughs> because a plane curve is never a limit of curves that are not contained in planes. <coughs> so there's not a whole lot of evidence for this, but it feels, it feels good to me. I mean, this, this seems like a reasonable thing. So that's conjecture B. <coughs> and we investigated that conjecture a little bit. Uh, now, there's a related version of this. See, this says that the minimal surface could not drop in degree. 
But I'd like something else. I'd like to know that the minimal surface also uh, couldn't get worse. So conjecture B prime. So as in conjecture B, suppose you have C containing CT, and all the CTs are containing a normal <coughs> surface XT of degree, minimal degree S of, of C of T. And suppose that C0 is contained in a, <coughs> how do I say it? <coughs> Supposing C0 is contained in a non-normal surface. Then the conclusion should be that D is bounded by some function phi of S. Uh, phi, I don't know exactly what it is, but for S equals 3, I think phi of S should be 10. So it's a little different. It's considering a family contained in normal, normal surfaces have only finite number of singularities, a non-normal surface. In that case, again, I want to say this can't happen unless the degree is small. And again, I have weak evidence for this. Uh, weak evidence. So evidence. Look at the case x equals 3. So in this case, we're talking about, about uh, Xt would be a normal cubic surface, or let's say non-singular, and then <coughs> X0 would be a singular cubic surface, like the, like the rule of surface, for example, the rule of cubic surface. So is it possible to have a family of smooth curves Ct be generated to a smooth curve C0 on this rule of cubic surface? <coughs> Now, already there was a hint of this, again, in the old paper of Guzman Pesquin. They observed that if you look at curves of families of curves of degree d and genus g on the rule cubic, sometimes the dimension of those is bigger than the dimension over here. So there's some curves over here that are not limits. Uh, this result has been refined by uh, a former student of mine, John Brebeck, and a man named Mordacini. And they say that in this situation, in the cubic surface, the degree must be less than or equal to 10. In other words, they show if you take any non singular curve of degree greater than 10 on the rule cubic surface, it is not a limit of smooth curves on uh, smooth or normal cubic surfaces. <coughs> so that's some evidence uh, for conjecture B prime. Of course, conjecture B prime uh, would imply uh, conjecture B, because <coughs> in the B case, the limit of the smallest surface is a reducible surface consisting of a smaller one plus something else. All right, now, uh, out of conjecture B prime, I want to go to a third conjecture. This is an entirely different question. It's the question of uh, lifting from characteristic P to characteristic zero. <clears throat> so the question is, if you have a curve C, let's say a non singular curve, contained in P3 over a field K, where characteristic of K is P, positive characteristic. Let's call this C0. Then you want to know, does there exist a family C, CT, contained in P3 uh, over the integers, for example, such that C0 equals the C0, and the general CT is smooth. Now it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be z. Uh, <clears throat> you could take take any extension field here and take some other some other ring, some other ring which reduces to characteristic zero and characteristic p. So the background for this is that when Grothendieck was first uh, studying deformation theory, he observed that if you take an abstract curve, so Grothendieck showed if c is an abstract, not embedded, not singular curve. Genus G, and characteristic P, he used deformation theory, and he could deform it bit by bit, uh, and eventually get it up to a curve of C bar and characteristic zero. <coughs> the point is that H2 of the tangent bundle, uh, tangent bundle of C, is equal to zero. The deformation, abstract deformation is in, is in H2 of the tangent bundle on the curve, it's dimension one, so there's no cohomology here. So the instruction to deforming the curve, abstract curve, it vanishes, so it's lifted to characteristic zero. So we observe that a curve characteristic P can be lifted to characteristic zero. 
And he asked, is this always possible? He sometimes asks naive questions. Or he asks a question without thinking about it. So very quickly, Sayer gave a counterexample. Sayer found a variety of dimension three in characteristic P. It could not be lifted to characteristic C as an abstract variety. And then Mumford improved on that and found it cut, it cut down Sayer's example to a surface and found a surface again. And since then, there have been other examples. Uh, I think uh, they know had one and uh, Ekebel maybe had one. And some people have proved other lifting. Delene showed that you could lift K3 surfaces and uh, somebody else showed you could lift the Delene surfaces. So there's been a long study of what you can lift and what you can't lift. And the question I'm asking here is a little different. I'm asking the question of embedded lifting. You give the curve together with the embedded. Of course, I can lift the curve as an abstract curve, but the abstract lifting might not live in P3. Uh, you could study that by saying, I'll lift the curve together with the line bundle that gives the embedding. You can do that. But then the section that defines the morphism P3 may not lift. So uh, this is sort of like, see, dimension one can always be lifted, and dimension two and higher can not. So this is like dimension one and a half. So I think it's a nice intermediate question. <coughs> so now I'd like to indulge in a little bit of fantasy uh, this, is, this is not so much mathematics as, as wishful thinking. I'm going to give you a wishful thinking proof of, of conjecture C over here. Uh, this, the conjecture would be, conjecture would be uh, it's not possible. Right, so I'll give you a fantasy, fantasy, fantasy proof uh, of that using the conjecture. Speculation. Speculation. Okay, so I'll start with the surface X, abstract surface in cash with P that cannot be lifted. Yeah. So, so the conjecture is that the lifting is not always possible. Not always possible, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then I want to create a counterexample. Okay, so I'll start with a surface that cannot be lifted. Can I say surface? Yeah, surface. <clears throat> so we know these exist by many people. Then I'll take an embedding of this <clears throat> into some <clears throat> large projected space. And I'll take it, I'll take it. Any surface can be embedded in projected space. So put it in a large projected space. Make, it makes it sufficient, take a sufficiently deupable embedding of that, such that, so this is P on A, such that when I take the generic projection down to P3, then its image, uh, X0, so X is going to project down to P3. Generic projection will have singularities, but uh, it, it may have singularities, and you can require them to be ordinary singularities. There's a double curve, and a finite number of triple points, and a finite number of hinge points. That's the theorem in characteristic zero, that any smooth variety of big, smooth surface of big projected space, you can project at only double curve and triple points and pinch points. <coughs> in characteristic P, it's not true, but I think if you take a sufficiently high du for embedding, then it becomes true. Again, I don't remember the exact details. Okay, so, so there, therefore, we'll imagine that X zero is a nice uh, surface with ordinary singularities, just these nice colors. Okay, now the next thing we want to do is we're going to take C in X, a hyperplane section, X intersect HF, a hypersurface section. So F is degree, some degree uh, delta, sufficiently long. So take a, a very large hypersurface section of X, and that'll be a certain non singular curve, very large degree. Now when you take the generic projection of a curve to P3, it stays non singular. So the projection of C will be C0, which will be non singular. <coughs> <clears throat> now, the next step is to go up to uh, P3 in characteristic zero, let's say uh, R, so characteristic zero, a mixed characteristic ring. And suppose that C0 could be lifted. So suppose it could be zero lifted to C0 bar. Suppose. <clears throat> then, what about the minimal degree surface? Certainly, certainly X0 is going to be the minimal degree surface containing X0. What about the minimal degree surface containing C0 bar? Uh, well, you see, there'd be a family. There'd be a family here. If the minimal degree surface was higher, then the, in specialization, it would suddenly drop. And that, can, that, that contradicts conjecture B. On the other hand, if the minimal, minimal degree surface is the same, let's call it uh, X0 bar, or X bar, that would be the thesis CT, right? If the minimal surface is the same, then here it's going to be uh, it's going to be a surface going to this one, and according to according to conjecture B prime, this one could not be non-singular because if this was non-singular or even normal, then it wouldn't get the singularities over here. 
So therefore, xt would have the same kind of singularities as x0, ordinary singularities. And then if you take the normalization of xt, you get xt uh, bar normalized, it would be a smooth surface, it's lifting the original x. Contradiction. Okay, this is a little bit of fantasy. So, so, there are a number of steps in this which, which require something and so on, but uh, if somebody is brave again, I think it's a possible uh, route. Maybe it would require some other, some, some more work at some point. There are some very, very simple known uh, surfaces which can be lifted non classical and liquid. Very simple? There are some very simple examples yeah. of non classical oh. surfaces, one in characteristic two, one in characteristic mm -hmm. three, yeah. by Reynolds. Did, did you try by hand? I didn't try that. No. No. So uh, there is a non classical in request, which is yeah. easy to do. Yeah. Okay, maybe you can try. <laughs> 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 I didn't have time to try, so I, I just throw this out. Another open problem if somebody would like to try. I think it would be a great result if you could prove the curve in the Okay, let's see. All right, so that was. Um, that was section three. It's, uh, there was uh, four conjectures. Conjecture A was the original conjecture about cascading. Uh, cascade. Conjecture B was about the reducible surface, B prime, and then C. This is conjecture C over here. <coughs> okay, take a big breath. And the last topic is still also about space curves. But it could be more general, uh, which is called local cohomology as demodulus. And this is ongoing current work uh, with uh, Claudia Polini at uh, Notre Dame University. And it starts uh, from the algebraic point of view. If you have a polynomial ring, A equals K of x1 up to, or say x0 up to xn, and K characteristic of K equals 0. And if you have an ideal I, you can consider local cohomology modules HI, I, of A. So people have been studying these uh, for a long time. If I is a maximal ideal, now if I is a maximal ideal, then there's a nice, uh, Jordan is a local duality theorem between the cohomology of the maximal ideal and, and some x, and there's this notion of cofinite modules and so on. And Jordan asked once, for an arbitrary ideal, does, uh, do these modules have a corresponding cofinitness problem, cofinitness property? Cofinite would be home of a mod i into m, let's call this m. Uh, finite regenerate. So he asked if, if these local homology were, were, were cofined in that sense. And in a paper I wrote some time ago, I guess you can't read that, that's not true. Uh, and since then, many people have been studying these local homology. These are not finitely generated modules. They're huge modules. And it's very hard to deal anything with them. But very recently, uh, a guy named Nubesnik observed that these modules, as A modules, they're huge. Um, they're actually D modules. And D modules are very nice. So let me explain what that means. Uh, you take the polynomial ring A, and you consider the der derivation. Bi equals B by Bxi. So if you have a polynomial, you can take its derivative. Right? So the partial der derivations act on the polynomial ring. And if you compose. Uh, the derivations and multiplications by A, you actually form a ring, new ring of D equals A of, sorry, K of X1 up to Xn, or X0. And then I'll put square curly brackets, D, I should say D0, up to Dn. I'm putting the curly brackets because if you take this ring of operators here, it's a non-commutative ring. So beware, non-commutative. That's because if you first multiply by a polynomial and then take a derivative, it's different from taking the derivative first and then multiplying by the polynomial because there's a, there's a derivation rule. <coughs> so anyway, the point is that the polynomial ring is, is actually a D module, uh, D actually. Let me give you a little exercise just to get used to this. So for example, 
A is a simple D module. In other words, A itself is a D module, it's D X on it, and the exercise is show it's simple. There's no submodules. Think about it. You can take any polynomial. If you have a submodule as a polynomial, you take enough derivatives, you get back to a constant, you multiply by the polynomials, you get anything. So it's simple. Another second example. Let's take E, which is K of x1 inverse, x up to x in inverse. So if this is sort of this is the Macaulay's inverse system. This is also the injective hull of the residue field over the ring. This is also a simple dimension. So uh, the best observation is that since A itself is a D module, anytime you take a polynomial with A, you can take the localized ring AF. This is also a D module. You just use the, you use the quotient formula to take derivations. <coughs> um, and then uh, you can compute local cohomology uh, by using a, by using it in terms of localizations. If I is generated by elements F1 up to FR, then you can compute HI by of A as a homology of a complex that begins A goes to the direct sum of AFI goes to the direct sum of AFI, FI, JJ. It's essentially, uh, so on. It's essentially the uh, check cohomology. If you look at the, on the spec of A, you can cover it with the U of FI, it's just the check cohomology. So, uh, therefore, <coughs> these are all D modules. Uh, D modules form a, uh, a category of kernels and co-kernels, so this becomes a D module. So it's an extra structure. Now the really nice thing is it's not only a D module, it's what they call a holonomic D module. When we explain that in detail, it will take too much time today. But uh, these are these are the nicest ones because the holonomic D modules are actually finite length as D modules. In other words, any holonomic D module has a finite composition series whose chunks are uh, uh, simple D modules. So any M would have a filtration and M contains M minus one and one, and the quotients are all simple D modules. So and you, you guys can use this theory to show, for example, that. Uh, if you take one of these local homology modules, the number of associated primes is finite. It's not obvious at all, it's not a finite general module. And the vast numbers are finite. So, how do you obtain the models from this problem? I mean, you should somehow know which uh, local homology corresponds to polynomial models. Well, they're all, they're all of them. Oh. <laughs> any any polynomial ring, any IDO, any index, they're all homology modules. Huh? Is that wonderful? Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. So I started learning about this. And by the way, uh, learning about D-modules is a little bit frightening. You, you just ask an expert, and he immediately is way out of here. He had no idea what he's talking about. And there's a bunch of books, and they're all very hard to read. There's a lot of category theory. So I, I'm, I'm a total beginner in D-modules. But anyway, we have a very small result, but I can tell you. Did you say it's Sivison? What? Did you say it's Sivison's story? This, this, what I'm telling you now, is very recent, yeah. yeah. Joint work with Claudia Polini, it's not published yet. Oh no, that's Lubeznik. That's 1990 something or other. No. But I'm about to tell you something new. So our question, our question was, if you take a curve in P3, non-singular curve. In the case of a non-singular curve in P3, there's only one interesting cohomology. So I is going to be IC contained in K of X, Y, Z, W, and there's only one cohomology, M equals H2 uh, of A is not zero, and the other, <coughs> the other local cohomology is zero. So here's a holonomic D module, and we asked ourselves, what are its simple components in its filtration? It has its holonomic D module as a filtration. What are its simple components? What are its simple components? And this spring, in order to learn something about D modules, I went to a conference in 
at uh, UIC, at the University of Illinois in Chicago uh, in February, I think. It was a, it was a three day conference for graduate students, actually. There's about 70 people from all over the country. And it was lectures by two or three experts on demotions. So I went to learn about something and I asked some of the experts, well, what, what are the simple components? Nobody knows. So nobody, nobody, nobody looked at that. They've been studying neural properties. So we set out to work that. And I can give you a little theory on that. So the theorem is that if we let m to h to i of a, under these hypotheses, right, c is an optimal of delta t3, then first of all, m has a simple uh, d module submodule M0 and M0 has support on the curve C. And in fact, uh, in the language of D modules, you can say exactly what it is. It's the so-called intermediate extension of the structure sheet OC on C. Because when you give a when you give a closed subvariety, you give an open subset of that, and you give a, an integral connection on the open subset, there's something called the, the um, <coughs> The intermediate extension. So if you take the take OC itself, its medium is going to be some some indecomposable thing, some some simple thing. So that's one. And then what about m over m0? M over m0 is going to be isomorphic to a direct sum of copies of E. <coughs> this where do we go? Uh, I erased it. A is the polynomial ring in four variables. So the, the, P3. The naive question, yeah. isn't this local cohomology module always supported on the curve because it is locally complete intersection? Oh yeah, yeah, it's supported on the curve. Okay. Yeah, but this is more specific. I'm talking about the simple. Okay. There's a simple one that's supported on the curve, and that one is uniquely determined by this process of taking the so-called intermediate extension. It shifts, the, it shifts the, the degree and the dimension and all kinds of things. But this is something that's known. The, the D module people know what this is. And if you know, you know, there's something called Riemann Hilbert correspondence, and then there's intersection cohomology, and there's all kinds of stuff I don't know anything about. They say, oh, that's, 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 that's what it is. So anyways, it's, it's a very natural thing here. But, but when it, you say that it is supported on C, do you mean that it is supported on the cone over C? So on the cone over C, yes. Yeah. Because these are modules over the polynomial ring. Yeah, it means on the cone over C. And then the, 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 what's left over, if you take away the simple one, what's left over is supported at the vertex of the cone, E, and the number of copies is exactly 2G. So G is the genus. Oh, well, anyway, that's our recent result. E is the injective hull of K over, uh, over the ring A. It's that same one as the Bacoli inverse system I wrote down before, K of Xi inverse. And this one supported the closed vertex. So if you, if you think of the cone over C, like here's C, the cone like this, the M0 is supported all over, and then the E is just supported at this point. And the number of copies is 2G. So if C was a curve and G is 0, for example, then the original module was simple already. And our technique, uh, <coughs> our technique is using algebraic Durand cohomology. Using algebraic Durand cohomology is the technique. And that goes back to Ogus's thesis. But can't you just use the resolution of the cone, which is uh, semi-small in this case? Say that again? Uh, it would be natural to use uh, the resolution of the cone, yeah. which is a semi-small resolution, and so it is very low. Uh, yeah, then you have to understand what happens to the D module when you go to the resolution. Yeah, but uh, it is smooth and it is much more simple question. Right? Oh. You know, well, if you know about D modules, maybe you know more than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, this is all I know. Okay, so I think I've got to stop. <coughs> Thank you.